We are here at my home with a very special guest who's just in town from Brazil for a few days. Her name is Keke Verdade, and she heads up the Ellis Fund, the largest women's foundation in Brazil. They're up against it in that country these days, but a lot of what they're facing will not be so unfamiliar to those of us in social movements here in the U.S. Tell us a little bit about what the Ellis Fund uh, does. Let's start there. Well, at Ellis Fund, we are the only women fund in Brazil. And so these days, we are, we are already 18 years old, and we are supporting uh, women-led organizations and LBT, led organizations uh, around, I would say, eight, uh, 80 or uh, grantees per year. So what kind of groups, what sort of things do they do? Well, they work on advocacy for women's rights, like stopping violence, also LBT rights. We have a lot of groups that are facing now, um, trying to push to stop racism in Brazil, black women-led organizations and um, young women organizations also trying to break this stereotype that young girls cannot lead, that they don't know very well what they are doing, you know, so all of this. All of this work, I'm sure, brought you into close contact with someone we think about deeply at this time of the year, around the world, I think, Mariela Franco. She was assassinated a year ago in Brazil Tell us a little bit about her, how you knew her, and the significance of that assassination. Yeah, Maria Eli Franco was an amazing person, amazing activist. She was very close to all of us in social movements, and uh, so she was representing us in this legislative power. She embodied all our fights. She was a woman, she was black, she was a lesbian, she was from a favela, you know, so specifically voices that are not heard in our politics in Brazil. So her assassination last year was, uh, was very traumatic. Uh, well, I could say a lot about the person, but I won't because I don't want to cry with you now. And uh, she was a, a close friend. But I would like to say about the... the, the, the the trauma that it, it was for social movements, you know? She was representing human rights movements in general. So when she got assassinated, uh, we couldn't see from our government action, you know? And actually it felt for some social movements like a straight message against those voices. These people cannot be participating in, in, in policy so much, you know, in politics so much. So it was really traumatic. So fast forward to the fall of last year, six months after the assassination of Mariela Franco, city council member in the city of Rio, we have the elections. And we have the election of Bolsonaro. What can you tell us about him and the relationship between those two events or, or were they related? After her assassination, we start to listen in, in social medias and uh, around society in general, a lot of hate speech. Hate speech starts to rise in Brazil, which was not, not common mm. at all. So there is a lot of hate speech, including against Marielle. Mm. Talking things like, oh, probably she, she, if she was from a favela, probably she would be connected to uh, drug trafficking, for example. There was a lot of hate speech against LGBT community as uh, for a, a misogynic hate speech against women in general. Mm -hmm. It seemed that uh, the people who were engaging in this hate speech, actually, they were supportive of Bolsonaro's uh, candidacy, you know. So now he's elected, and what are you seeing? Well, then it went even worse. Because once he was elected, somehow these people who are spreading hate speech, they felt in a comfortable way, you know. They felt comfortable and legitimized, mm -hmm. you know, by his election. And so we are seeing this hate speech uh, getting more brutal and, uh, and each time more easy to find, you know? So 
I would imagine that you are kind of on the front lines of all of this. Visible, leader of a women's foundation, focused in part on LBT issues and LGBT issues. What's it like for you, just on the streets and then in your work? I mean, it was complicated because we were, I mean, there was something so crazy about this uh, hate speech and fake news. I know you, you have experienced something like this in the previous election here. Um, so they were connecting, for example, women's movement to left uh, wing parties, for example, mm -hmm. which we know that is not like that. Right. We know that women's rights are difficult to achieve, even if an, you know, a left uh, party is in power or a right party is in power doesn't I mean there are no guarantees mm -hmm. that we are going to achieve women's rights right but some of those um, hate speech were against activism mm -hmm. and there is also now uh, atmosphere of <clears throat> criminalization of social movements we see uh, rising a bit of uh, repression against uh, social movements from from this new government and uh, and there is of course a lot of demands and needs from democratic social movements uh, led by women you know towards Ellis asking for support you know in in many ways so we know in this country that our media tend to portray hate speech online and aggression against you know, social movements as sort of a naturally occurring phenomenon. How do you explain it? Are there visible sources of this aggression towards your groups, meaning organized sources, or, or is it just random individuals? Well, I would say that our uh, main concern about this is how this hate speech or this intolerance becomes a public policy or become uh, a, uh, main strategies of our government, you know? So, for example, in terms of, uh, we used to have a women's ministry. Mm -hmm. We no longer have. It was mixed together. Women's ministry and human rights ministry, and then they have added a family minister and then they say for example that to put all this together means that human rights are no longer for minorities now is a broader perspective human rights for everybody i don't know what you think about this but we fear a lot because uh it's a perspective that uh, the previous understanding of human rights was uh, was like just for a few people or something like this actually is not like that and um, and also there is this family uh, concept coming up you know like and what they understand by family is this very narrow perspective of a family it's just a man and a woman and their children other sorts of families are no families at all so you're hearing much of the same things that we hear here. The response to Black Lives Matter is, well, all lives matter. Police lives matter. The response to LGBT people asking for their families that have always been excluded to be recognized is to say all families should be recognized. By shedding differences, you miss the discrimination that's happened, and, and you're really incapable of addressing it. Exactly. This is our worry. Are because it is becoming public policy. Are you hearing this term gender ideology? Oh, yes, Laura. And what does it mean? And what are you hearing? I mean, they, I mean, they say that gender ideology is to tackle any sort of gender inequality or talking about diversity. So if you try to make these conversations at schools, for example, it's like seems that you are representing a political party and they say this you know, so they say that this is a specific group ideology and that is a single understanding of uh, that we tend to believe that uh, men and women are different but they are not you know that everything is fine that we should not tell uh, boys and girls that they can choose their gender, for example. 
So, I mean, they mix a lot of concepts. It's like, it's like a, the fight that they have against gender ideology is, feels for us of social movements a fake news, you know? Mm -hmm. Because they, they misunderstand all the, the whole idea of human rights and, and gender equality. It sounds very much like what we saw in the States in the early 90s where right-wing organizations, especially media organizations, released videos and programs about the gay agenda, which was their take on LGBT people asking for any rights, any equality. There was an insidious, dangerous, scary-seeming gay agenda. That's what gender ideology sounds like to me, a sort of scary agenda coming out of feminism um, or an attempt to foment that kind of fear. Does it, does it work? Yeah, you, it does work. And what they did by saying that there is a war against gender ideology is to forbid in all uh, public policies of health, of education, to have any of these terms or concepts you know there so for example you cannot have gender written in any policies you cannot have uh, sex orientation sexual diversity you cannot have even race diversity you cannot have those terms anymore and it's all under this big flag of war against gender ideology what do you do and, and how have social movements in Brazil been responding? And then my next question is, how can we help? How can social movements in the States perhaps help? We are in Brazil very interested in, in, in rising some international solidarity. And I believe that uh, the case of Marielle Franco's assassination is one opportunity for us to engage internationally. You know, we see, I mean, it's been a year. We don't have answers from our government. She represented all democratic social movements and all this diversity of opinions. So I think it's an opportunity for us to engage. I think with international support, we definitely can get more answers for this assassination. So bring us back to the streets of Brazil today and how you are maintaining your spirit to do this work. Um, what is it like for you in the streets? And will it be safe for people to be protesting around the assassination of Mariela this year? Yeah, thank, thank you for bringing this. Actually, what we have seen is that some of the protests uh, have been repressed in any way. So one of the main needs of, of women's uh, movement these days would be for security, for improving security, uh, digital security, or even physical security is some of our concerns. Probably you know that Brazil has a very experienced and vivid women's movement very diverse and uh, that has been building this recent democracy since the 80s. I think the, the, the hope for changing this into a much better society relies on our social movements, relies on those uh, women's um, movements and what we have is to be in alliance and strengthening our, our fight. Thank you so much. It's been wonderful talking to oh, you. Oh, thank you.